Good morning. Some years are unremarkable, but this year, everything changed. Hi, everybody. His luck ran out. I want you to know how sad I am to be giving up the best job in the world. But them's the brakes. Politics Joker King removed by his own. On the never never, I would start. Replaced by a new prime minister. Uh, Simply not right. You promised. With a very new direction. I have a bold plan to grow the economy through tax cuts and reform. But neither the country nor the markets were quite ready for Liz Truss. Before her exit, a long goodbye to the country's constant. The death of Queen Elizabeth, the mark of an exceptional year. With war in Europe, the backdrop, and strife at home too. What do we want? When do we want it? A set of nightmare problems for 2022's Prime Minister number three. We have one big question this morning. Will the strikes ruin Rishi Sunak's Christmas? Oliver Dowden is the man the Prime Minister trusts to deal with the strikes and he's with us live. If Labour wins the election, Yvette Cooper would be Home Secretary. She's with us from Norwich today. And Splashdown, the space mission Orion is back from the moon. So is Howard Hugh from NASA to tell us how it went. Oh, it was, I mean, it went as, as planned uh, exceedingly well. And to contemplate a crazy year and look to the next, a stellar trio with me here, the Archbishop of Canterbury, Justin Welby, the editor of The Sun, Victoria Newton, and the broadcaster, Susanna Reid. very warm welcome to our last program of 2022. Can you believe it? A bit later, we will replay some of those jaw-dropping moments. But first, let's look at what's moving this morning. On the front pages, a few different stories. The Sunday Times and The Sun on Sunday talking about Harry and Meghan calling for an apology and some kind of summit with the rest of the royal family. But strikes on the other front pages, The Sunday People saying Rishi has 48 hours to stop the NHS strikes. The Observer also featuring that story and also the Sunday Telegraph talking about the military having concerns about being brought in to help out. Um, let's talk about that first of all. Um, Archbishop, it is a real time of strife, isn't it, in so many ways? It seems that there's strife everywhere at the moment, yeah, and uh, in this country and around the world. And we're seeing that in a very serious way. I think the biggest, uh, at a time of real difficulty like this for so many people, the biggest challenge is to have a vision for this country that enables us to come together and grow together. Um, and that's something that Funnily enough, I'm working on with Victoria and, and um, on a group called Together. Uh, and there are lots of people doing that. And we're coming together to celebrate Christmas. And that is a great moment of togetherness. Do you feel that it's lacking at the moment, though? I think, I think there is. I think we, we just haven't adjusted to the way in which we communicate is one way, is one problem. I think also where um, we've become very unforgiving. When people make a mistake, they're absolutely, um, use a phrase from my own world, crucified for it. And, uh, sorry, I couldn't think of another word. Um, I think you're allowed to make that joke if anyone is. <laughs> uh, yes, I suspect it wasn't a joke at the time, but yes. And um, I think we, people suffer hugely when they go wrong, uh, not just with public exposure, but the awful trolling that goes on. And the inability to accept uh, apologies, to seek forgiveness, those are, are really difficult things. Well, I'm sure we might touch on that later. Um, Victoria, the government is having to grapple with strikes in all sorts of industries. I mean, in your paper, one of your papers this morning, The Sun on Sunday, Rishi Sunak's written quite a punchy piece, basically saying, I'm not giving in, I'm not in a mood to reconcile. Do you think he's going to be able to hold that line? Well, it seems like he's determined to hold the line. Um, I think you perhaps would have seen with Boris Johnson, he perhaps would have uh, shifted maybe on the nurses. Um, 
But the Prime Minister's point is that we cannot afford any rises at this time and um, it will lead to higher inflation if we do. So he's determined to stick to that point. Do you think, though, politically that can hold? I mean, we know that there may not be sympathy for all the strikes and polling's very different on the different sectors of the economy, but the public support for the nurses' strike at this stage looks pretty solid. Support for the nurses, I would certainly say, is pretty solid, certainly from our readers. Um, there's a lot less sympathy with the other strikes with my readers, quite mm. unanimously, actually. Um, but it'll be a tough one for him on the nurses. But um, it's interesting that Keir Starmer has also said, I wouldn't be able to commit to the 19% either. Mm. Um, I think clearly what needs to happen is, is there need to be more talks to try and resolve it. Um, Susanna, I mean, like me, you spend time asking politicians whether they can, where they're going to budge and what they're going to do on a very regular basis. I mean, and I know also your mum was a nurse, yeah. so this is sort of personal for you. How, how do you think the government's handling it? You're right. I mean, my mum uh, registered as a nurse 60 years ago and has been a nurse on hospital wards, has been a community nurse, has been a health visitor. She was uh, community editor of Nursing Times magazine, so she was even in nursing journalism. And she still volunteers as a chaplain at the Evelina Children's Hospital, uh, just round the corner it's from, right from Lambeth Palace. Yeah. So she sees what nurses are going through every week when she volunteers, but we see what nurses are going through every day. Mm -hmm. And the fact of the matter is, the government has got to sit down and talk with the union leaders about pay. Because the nurses have been underpaid for far too long. Mm. And their point is that it's got to a point where it's unsafe. We need nurses to feel valued. And we need nurses who are going to continue doing the job. So we need to retain nurses and we need to recruit nurses as well. And unless the government gives a little bit of way on this, we're not going to come to a deal which is going to satisfy the nurses and keep us all safe. Well, in a couple of moments, we'll be putting that to Oliver Dowden, who's got the unenviable task of dealing with all of this on behalf of the government. But let's just show you what the Prime Minister has been saying this morning, writing for The Sun, that union chiefs are behaving like the Grinch at Christmas. There's quite a clear effort there from the government to target union leaders and Mick Lynch, the boss of the rail union in particular. And of course, this week has been absolutely dominated by strikes, no question about that. So let's get on with our conversation with the government minister who is in charge of that. Nurses, posties, rail workers, the list of industrial action goes on. Oliver Dowden has the grand title of the Chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster, but his day-to-day -day job right now is probably quite unenviable. He's the man who's trying to manage the impact of the strikes right across the government. Um, there's an ambulance strike this week. Um, if you break your leg and call an ambulance on Wednesday, can you guarantee that one will actually turn up? Well, I would say to ambulance union leaders, the single best thing they can do to ensure that that guarantee is available is even at this late moment to call off this strike, continue to engage and give families and people up and down the country a break on the specifics of it. Uh, we have been clear that we are working to ensure that if you have a serious injury, in particular life threatening injury, you can continue to rely on the ambulance service. And we would urge people in those circumstances to dial 999. If it is the case that you have less serious injuries, you should be in touch with 111 and you should seek to make your way to hospital on your own if you are able to do so. But of course the government is working relentlessly to try and ensure that we get that high level of, of service available for people in the most difficult circumstances. But it really is in the union's hands. I would urge the unions to be reasonable, to engage both in terms of calling off this strike, but also in terms of the kind of level of service they're willing to provide. OK, well, let's talk about the nurses' strike, because as everybody knows, it is historic that they have decided to walk out in this way. How would you explain to a nurse watching this morning on a starting salary of £27,000 that their contribution to society is worth less than the median salary? Well, the contribution of nurses we saw throughout the whole COVID crisis is enormous. We value nurses enormously. That is why, for example, last year, when all public sector pay was frozen, we made an exemption for nurses. They got 3%. How we've tried to resolve this is by taking the politics out of it and putting it to the independent pay review body. And that determined that nurses across the board, including those on the lowest salaries, would get a minimum of £1,400. That's about 9% pay rise. And that everyone would get at least 4%. Now, the alternative to that 
if we go for the kind of 19% that is being urged on us by the nursing unions, mm -hmm. that is simply not affordable. That could, and what, if and we applied, the, this is an important point, Laurie, if we mm -hmm. applied this across the board, that would cost families a thousand pounds each and it would also add to inflation and make us all poor in the long run. Is that so I have true to say that it would cost that, everyone £1,000? We will be pounds. reasonable about this, mm -hmm. but we will be resolute in doing so because well, well, we need talk to protect the gains we've made is, so far. Is it true that it would cost everybody, every household, £1,000 to give them that pay rise? Yes, it would. If you, if you take... In fact, it, would, it potentially costs more than that. The £1,000 the assumption is if we match inflation next year across the board for all public sector workers, that mm -hmm. would cost... A thousand pounds and that that is a demonstration of the scale of this and i think the government is being reasonable we're being sensible and we would urge the unions to be reasonable as well in doing but so how have you worked out we, those we figures are, we're, making, we're making progress with mm -hmm. the economy and don't put that at risk with these unsustainable but, demands this is about these numbers how have you worked out that it would cost every household a thousand pounds a year to give public sector workers an inflation matching pay rise so we have taken the level of inflation mm -hmm. which is is currently about 10, 11%, mm -hmm. and we have projected that forward for next year because that, that's what you'd expect it uh, to, uh, to apply to, and that would give £1,000 for every family mm -hmm. if we match that for the public sector. Well, we've had a look at your numbers, as you'd expect, and we've asked the Treasury also, also how they worked it out. Now, your figures have used the fi inflation figure of 11%, which is just for one month. The OBR actually projects that next year inflation will be far less than that. Not to speak of it, when you're normally working about um, pay negotiations, you've cut an average of inflation, not just one month, which is what you have done. So it's not £28 billion, pounds, is it? Well, the requests from the striking unions across the board is generally about uh, CPI. That, and the CPI level of inflation is currently mm -hmm. between 10 and 11%. And actually, if you look in the case of nurses, they want RPI plus 5%. Actually, that gives you 19%. So mm -hmm. you could actually argue that we're underestimating the number. Well, you think it might be more than that. If that's the case, then why have the independent number crunchers, the Institute for Fiscal Studies, come up with a figure of £14 billion pounds as being the cost of doing this? Well, you'd have to ask the IFS how they justify their numbers. But what I can tell you is our number is justified on the basis of taking the inflation number, which mm -hmm. is what the unions are asking for, and projecting it forward to next year. That would give you a cost of about £28 billion, pounds, and that's £1,000 per but household. But your inflation numbers that you're using are actually inaccurate and out of date. If you're talking about next year's pay settlement, nobody expects inflation. The OBR, who are independent, don't expect inflation to be anything like that next year. And this for nurses and other public sector workers watching, this is about this year's pay deal. So if you want to be honest with people this morning, your numbers are not... It are not completely accurate, are they? Well, actually, Laura, I completely disagree with you on that. If the unions are turning around to us and saying, for example, the nurses' union, no, we don't want 19%. If the fire brigades' union and That's others are saying, question, actually, Oliver we don't Dayton. want to have CPI. You about your fact, estimate. No, this is an important no, no, this point. Is, this is an important we, point we can for only, our viewers. Forgive me, we can only take the number mm -hmm. that we have now. The, number of, mm -hmm. the inflation number we have now it was a bit over 11% last month, it's dropped very slightly to 10.7%. It is reasonable to take that number and project it forward and say what it would cost next year. But now, why wouldn't you take the number that that's come from the Office for Budget Responsibility lower, Minister? If they are saying that they want to have a lower number, mm -hmm. then that is a different proposition, and that's not what that. they're coming I'm to the table with. I'm not asking you about what the unions are saying. I'm asking you about what government ministers like you have been telling the public for several weeks now, which is that it would cost every single household in the country a thousand pounds to meet these pay demands. And we've looked very carefully at your numbers and many other number crunchers looking at them would say your numbers do not quite stack up. And if you're repeatedly telling the public something that is a bit misleading, how can people trust you to negotiate and to deal with the unions in good faith? Well, Laura, I categorically disagree with you in that assertion. And in fact, I spent a lot of yesterday and the day before discussing exactly these numbers. These are robust numbers. The unions are saying that they want us to match inflation. Inflation is currently between 10 and 11 percent. If we gave that across the public sector, which essentially is the demand for most public sector unions, indeed for the nurses it's a higher number, that would cost £28 billion. That's £1,000 per household. And the reason why we're saying this number, and this is important, is because I would love to give nurses an enormous pay rise. Of course, and the Prime Minister would love as well to give them a 19 percent pay rise. The reason why we're not doing this is because 
Our duty is to everyone, public and private sector, to make sure we have stability in our public finances and look at this, the progress we've made already in restoring that stability. And of course that's an We don't want to put and, that and, at and risk. And, and also there's a further point, and those of your, list, your, your viewers and listeners and everyone else engaging with this who have longer memories will remember what happened when we allowed public sector pay to get out of control last time around, the kind of inflationary mm -hmm. pressures you get from that. If we deal with this now, we help to get the economy stronger, we mm -hmm. get the economy growing, then we can afford the kind think, of pay rises. Do you think we giving nurses more than £27,000 a year would be letting pay get out of control? Really? Well, we are giving nurses more than that. And the, the kind of nurses you're describing there, on, and it's important on that point, yeah. you're talking about the starting salary. Actually, mm -hmm. the average uh, salary for a typical nurse is more like 37000 when you take into account their, their extra hours and so on. But for those on the, the lower salaries, mm -hmm they're getting £1,400, which is about a 9% pay rise. I would, of course, like to give them more than that, mm -hmm. but the only way we could do that is by having a strong economy. We cannot risk the stability of our public finances. Mm -hmm. That wouldn't be a reasonable thing to do. And, of course, do. you can absolutely legitimately make that economic argument, even though a lot of economists, including people like the former Permanent Secretary of the Treasury, disagree that giving public sector workers a bit more would contribute to inflation. But, you, but you've made that point. Um, our viewers will have heard ministers also say, as you have done this morning, say repeatedly that you have to follow the recommendations of the pay review bodies. How many times has the government ignored their recommendations this year? Well, I think if you, if you look across the piece for all the public uh, pay review body recommendations, I think if you take sort of 20 or 30 of the, the past few years, mm -hmm. I think there's only been, been about three or four occasions when we haven't been able to follow that, and that's been an exceptional circumstance. Well, there have been four this year alone, actually four times when the government has ignored the pay review bodies who everybody uh, says are independent and they have a job to do so if you've already ignored them four times this year why can't you ignore them on the nurses strike for precisely the reasons that i've set out to you that we want to take the politics out of this we have an independent process and we should adhere to that and by the way it's not just us saying it labor shadow chancellor was saying in the summer that we should adhere to it if, if we don't have this kind of independent framework mm -hmm. we've got no basis for ensuring that we do this in a fair way across the board but why and this was it is, okay this, is, this but, but... is all about making mm -hmm. sure we have a fair mm -hmm. straightforward way of, of doing this to meet the needs of nurses and, and, and other public sector workers whilst balancing the risks but of why, public finances. But why was it okay then to ignore those recommendations when it came to prison service pay or senior civil servant pay or judges pay or as Jeremy Hunt who's now the Chancellor tried to ignore the recommendations back in 2014 why was it okay to ignore them then and it wouldn't be okay to ignore them now. Well, I, I think in those specific circumstances that there, were, there was acute pressure on, on public finances at, at the time. Yeah, well, but, prison but, service, but, but civil Laura, service, Laura, judges, Laura, that's you this give me year. A, you give, if you give me a moment to, to answer this question. The public sector pay review bodies have looked at the level of inflation, by the way, the expected level of inflation. They've looked at the pressure on the lowest paid workers. That's why, for example, they've given 9%. Mm -hmm. So actually by following that, that is ensuring that nurses will get a significantly higher level of, of pay settlement than they have done previously. And actually by following the pay review body mm -hmm. recommendations, we're giving some of the highest pay settlements for 20 years. Now, of course, I know everyone across the public and private sector is struggling at the moment with the consequence of the war in Ukraine, with COVID, with, as we recover from COVID. We want to give people more, but I would say to the unions, please give families a break this Christmas, follow this independent pay review process, allow us to continue with this stability, get a stronger economy, and then we can give people the kind of pay rises we dearly love to give them. But it is though, can you accept, it's a political choice, because in some cases, your government has ignored the pay review bodies, making the independent recommendations, in this case, when it comes to the nurses, you are determined to stick to it. So you are making a political choice for the reasons you've outlined perfectly legitimately to stick with the recommendations. And that means saying no to the nurses in their request for more pay. And it even right now means saying no to even talking about pay with them again. Well, I would say three things. First of all, by following those recommendations, it's actually ensuring they get a higher pay settlement than was the case when, when it wasn't followed in the circumstances you described. Secondly, there is consensus on this, or there has been. The, the Labour Party, the Shadow Chancellor over the summer endorsed the process, and there's a reason why she endorsed it, why we endorse it, because it is taking the politics uh, out of 
the process. In terms of your point about engaging, of course our door is always open to engagement with the, the unions. And I would say to people across the private and the public sector, and by the way, in the private sector, the average pay yeah. settlement at the moment is about 4%. We're trying to be reasonable, we're trying to be proportionate, and we're trying to be fair, but in return, the unions need to be fair and reasonable. They should call off these strikes and give people a break. But this all matters so much because in the NHS and when it comes to the nurses, you literally cannot get the staff. Now, I know that the government has hired more nurses, so we know that, that's out there, that is true. But in a year, more than 34,000 nurses left, and there are 50,000 vacancies. So this isn't just about them asking more money. This is about a service that in some places is on its knees because they cannot get the people. And isn't it the case, Minister, that unless you're willing to talk about giving them more pay, that situation is just going to get worse? Well, first of all, we're always willing to talk, and I know the Health Secretary, Steve well, Buckley, who talk about pay this, at the is, at is the engaging moment. with them. But you, you raise some wider points about the NHS, which are wholly uh, legitimate. The first thing, and you'll forgive me for saying this, but it is really important to, to re-emphasise it. As we have emerged from COVID, that put huge pressure on the NHS and has created enormous backlogs. It is actually the case that even since the beginning of COVID, we've got many more doctors, many more nurses, and we're making good progress but the vacancy towards rate recruiting. Is going we're, up. we're making good progress towards recruiting 50,000. What is happening at the same time, though, is these two enormous pressures on the NHS. One is as we try and recover from the backlog of COVID. And then the second one is just the underlying demographic pressure as we have an ageing population. And I know that that's specifics. putting pressure on nurses and people across the board. That's why the Prime Minister is determined to, to work through those challenges, for example, with uh, delayed discharge. But you have to take into account the wider factors that are at play here. And one of the results of those wider factors is that the NHS is spending a fortune on agency staff to plug the gaps. Now, which is cheaper, giving the nurses a pay rise or paying for agency staff? Because the NHS spent about three billion pounds on agency staff last year. Have you worked that out? Well, we are we're cracking down on agency spending, but of course, but have Laura, you worked you're, it out? Laura, which is you're cheaper? Forgive me, you're absolutely right. Uh, that, that we want to move off reliance on agency staff and recruit more nurses, which is precisely what we're doing, not just with the 50,000 target, and we're over halfway to that, but that's, for example, why we gave nurses a £5,000 bursary. That's not reimbursable, so they, they don't have to pay that back. That was on the recommendation of the RCN. That's why we're increasing training places. Of course, we know that we need to recruit more nurses. And by the way, we also need to give a pay rise to nurses on the lowest pay, which is why we gave them... I think 9.3%, £1,400 across the board. That's when pay across the wider private sector, and of course, two thirds of the, the population work in the private sector, they're getting about 4%. So we are, I know things are challenging, but we are trying to be reasonable throughout all of this. I would urge the unions to be reasonable. But I have to say, we will be resolute in response to this because it will be irresponsible to allow public sector pay and inflation to get out of control. And we owe a wider duty to the public to make sure we keep our public finances under control and we build a growing economy that can pay for these things. Okay. Oliver Dowden, we've heard your message loud and clear. Thanks so much for coming into the studio this morning. Thank Thanks, you. Laura. Now, it's unlikely that anything will get easier for the government in 2023, whether on strikes or anything else. But genuinely, it's hard to imagine it could be any more dramatic than 2022. We only started our conversations in this studio in September. So let's take a look back. Strap yourself in. Hello, and a very warm welcome to a new show and a new political era. Tomorrow, one of these two will be chosen as our new prime minister. You've beaten them all, haven't you? You've outwitted your critics. Look, I, I am focused on getting the job done. Well done, Liz. <laughs> See, I'm actually very right wing and I loved it. If you don't win this time, would you ever run again? Oh, gosh, I, uh, we just finished this campaign, Laura. This one era closes, another opens. She would listen, she would ask questions. She fulfilled her duties right up until the end. And she loved your grandfather. She did love him. Church, he loved too. her. He loved her. He'd known her since she was a child and he he loved her very much indeed he revered her so i put my hands together and she put hers outside mine and we were silent for three minutes and at the end she said 
Amen. When I got up, the burden had lifted. There will continue to be an evolution in our relationship. Mm -hmm. I don't um, believe it will be uh, it will be quick or soon, but over the course of, of my lifetime. If you look at the monarchy, it and, and the royal family, they have been steadily evolving a different approach, a different way of doing things over time. And I'm sure that King Charles will take that, continue to take that forward. At the Accession Council, all the former prime ministers, what were you talking about? Well, the, the number of ex-prime ministers is growing. It's the club that no one wants to join and you never get to leave. Good morning from the Labour Party conference in Liverpool. What's reasonable in your view? Well, look, it's reasonable for people to want to pay rise. It's not for me to wade in and say, I think it should be this amount or that amount. An era of massive tax cuts, cheered by Tories in the chamber. And there's more to come. We've only been here 19 days. I do accept we should have laid the ground better. How many people voted for your plan? What do you mean by that? Using borrowed money to fund tax cuts. That is not conservative. The question to me is, would I prefer a Labour government over a Tory government? I, I detest the Tories and everything they stand for. I'm not sure I've ever seen a week like the last seven days. A total smash-up of politics and economics. Who's in charge? You or her? Look, the Prime Minister's in charge, and really? I think it's... I am resigning as leader of the Conservative Party. The Conservative Party decides in the next few days who should lead our country. He'll be running, she is running, and he's come back from the Caribbean claiming he has the backing to have a go. There's a huge amount of talent on the back benches. I'm not talking about me. A warm welcome to the first Sunday of the Sunak era. Cheer up, Rishi. Is everybody going to pay more tax? We are going to see uh, everyone paying more tax. We're going to see spending cuts. You also would have to rein in public spending and put taxes up. I do recognise that an incoming Labour government will not be able to do everything that we want as quickly as possible. Hello, hi. The prices are going up in Ukraine as well. But in addition, our people get killed. Russia wanted to take the cities, it failed. Russia wanted to subjugate Ukraine, it's failed and it's failing dramatically. Ukraine needs drones. They have some drones, but not nearly as many as the Russians. Technology changes even faster than the Conservatives change their leader. What I want to be really careful of is that there aren't headlines saying Kate Winslet attacks big tech. I just think that the people who know that they could do better to protect our children should just be doing that. Did you feel a cure for cancer is in your grasp? Yes, we feel that uh, a cure of, uh, uh, for cancer or, or to changing cancer patients' life uh, is in, in our grasp. Three, two, one, and lift off of Artemis One. We're going to be sending people down to the surface and they're going to be living on that surface and doing science. What are you hoping to achieve by putting people back on the moon? Where could that lead us? Moving forward is really to Mars. We rise together back to the moon and beyond. See, look, we've even taken you to the moon on this programme. All sorts of things in store after, you know, what, a 12 months. Um, Victoria Newton, for you, what's your overriding memory of so much turmoil? Well, the most seismic thing that's obviously happened to our nation this year has been the death of our beloved Queen. We are still feeling that now. Um, the sense of reassurance that she gave everybody has now gone. And um, we're going to be looking at uh, the first ever King's speech on national telly, because the one pre prior to that, I think, was on radio. Um, there have been lots of subtle changes that the King's made already. Um, I mean, you noticed only last week he was going around hugging people and dancing with people at the Jewish Community Centre. I don't think the Queen would have done that. So this sort of change we're, we're going to see more of. Um, and then obviously politics, wow. 
I mean, how many prime ministers can we have in one year? I don't know. I mean, Susanna, the political turmoil. I mean, when you watch all of those clips with different prime ministers and ins and outs and exits and, and arrivals, what do you make of it? Well, when David Cameron said the ex-prime ministers club keeps on growing, who would have thought it would have grown so much in one year? Um, I was at Downing Street back in May interviewing Boris Johnson mm -hmm. in the wake of Partygate, uh, you know, in the early stages of the war um, in Ukraine and the cost of living crisis. My first question to him, are you honest, Prime Minister? I mean, within a couple of weeks, he was an ex-Prime Minister. He hoped to come back. Uh, he didn't. It's been an absolutely tumultuous year in politics. You do wonder... Uh, when the next Prime Minister came in, Liz Truss, how much, if we hadn't had that catastrophic mini-budget, how much we might have been able to give to the nurses. Remarkable interview you just did with Oliver Dowden, where he insisted the government is not going to move an inch over this. And, you know, when you think about the fact that when you ask people what makes them proud to be British, mm. the NHS and the Queen are the two things which people kept saying... We've lost the Queen and look at the state of the NHS. We spent two years clapping for nurses and other NHS workers and now we won't give them what they're asking for. And I'm not... It's interesting, he said, well, we're not going to give them the 19%. Yeah. I saw Pat Cullen on your programme mm -hmm. last week... College of Nurses, su yeah. From well, she, the union, suggesting there was room for manoeuvre. Well, she made it quite clear that she wouldn't dig in if they didn't, but it doesn't mm. sound like we got very much further forward. But, uh, Archbishop, I know um, you've had a, a huge year, but recently you went to Ukraine. I think we mm. can show our viewers some of the pictures of you visiting there. I mean, what struck you on that visit? Because it's such an enormous global event, but also were you personally affected by your visit? I was. Um, there, were, there were a number of different things. Uh, there was an extraordinary moment when I was in a meeting with all the church leaders and all the faith leaders, and everyone's... Uh, you have an app on your phone which does the air raid warning, and everyone's air raid warnings went off. So we went down... Um, into the basement and carried on with the meeting and they were all completely relaxed about that. They were quite used to it. I think the other thing that struck me was uh, seeing the site of the mass grave at Butcher, mm -hmm. the photos of what had been done to the people there, um, the rape, the massacres, the torture by the occupying Russian forces. And um, hearing from those who are studying uh, the, the ideology which is driving these attacks, that it is an ideology of conquest and it wants Ukraine less worried about the people but very worried about getting historic Ukraine back and realising how important it is that we support the, the Ukrainian effort because Essentially, they are. Um, if if they go, it's not going to stop from their ideology, and that that was very strange. There was a guy called Ivan, who um, uh, who's a Baptist minister, runs a training college for clergy there, and um, he's been get, he, during the occupation. He was getting people out across a bridge called the Bridge of Hope, yeah. and there are crosses all the way down the side of that bridge which is blown up and each cross represents someone who was killed by a sniper as they went across and it just brings home the reality of the suffering and the importance of our support for Ukraine. But, but often there would be attempts, suggestions of reconciliation, making peace but from what you're saying that's, that's not possible. Ukraine must well, be supported till the I've end. spent 20 years working in areas of severe conflict and one of the first rules is you can't talk about reconciliation while the guns are firing because people are just concentrating on whether they're alive for the next 20 minutes and uh, for them reconciliation uh, they were talking about this they were saying for us that word means surrender and we're not going to do that I think it is there is a way forward, and that's withdrawal and ceasefire by Russian forces. But for people here watching, we are all, you know, unusually for a, a conflict far away. Everyone's feeling the consequences with their 
energy bills, struggling with the cost of living. And I remember when we went to Kyiv, we talked to the First Lady of Ukraine and she said, it's a price that you, we, ha we pay in blood, you all have to pay too because of the scale of the, of the threat. But I how think do you explain it to people at home who you know, are worrying about putting money in the meter to keep the lights on? That is a very, very, that is an enormous problem. It's the other massive issue going on at the moment, which is the cost of living. And we see it in the church in 400% increase uh, in people coming to the, for, uh, to the food banks. 400% you said? 400% the last 18 months um, of the number of people seeking help. We're seeing this continually, debt rising, uh, pressures on families, just at, at all sorts of levels. But what the Ukrainians are doing, I think she put it really, really powerfully. They're paying in blood. They've lost 100,000 dead, wounded and killed. That is incredible. It's half of the number of people who died in this country in three years from COVID. It's an enormous cost. Their infrastructure is being destroyed. We're supporting their action at one remove. Effectively, we're in the same struggle at one remove. When Ukraine was invaded at the decision of President Putin, the gates of hell were opened and every evil force came out across the world. I was in Mozambique the week before I was in Ukraine, mm -hmm. where there's famine all the way up the East African coast. There's, uh, there's inflation, as we know in this country. There's an energy crisis. There's cold, there's suffering, there's shortage of drugs. Everything evil has been unleashed. And until there is withdrawal and ceasefire, we can't make progress on reconciliation. And that in that sense, is a huge moment of history. You know, as there has been this year, Victoria, you mentioned it already um, with the Queen's passing and of course you were officiating at that ceremony and we can show people uh the pictures of that taking place and those extraordinary few weeks from for the country um when you watch that now archbishop what goes through your mind what goes through my mind is possibly i mean first of all how beautifully it was done the fact that she was the queen of the whole world i mean 200 nations represented at, at the funeral it was extraordinary. I remember I was having to be about six foot away from President Biden when he came in. And this is the most, you know, the head of the most powerful country on earth. His respect was striking for, for the Queen. But my memory is, it goes further than that. It goes a bit further back. I last saw her in early July. She lived life of duty and service to literally the last day of her life. And one of the things that will have been, we understand a great sadness for the Queen towards the end of her life was the conflict in the family with um, Harry and Meghan. And the newspapers this morning, no surprise, have got more of that story. We can show you the Sunday Times and the Sun, both saying that Harry and Meghan want some kind of apology and a royal summit. Um, obviously, this is in the wake of the Netflix uh, series, all six episodes in glorious Technicolor of their es escape from the UK as they seem to see it, and their new life in California. Now, Victoria, in those programmes and in the newspapers, there's a real uh, narrative from Harry and Meghan that there was somehow a sort of conspiracy against them between the palace and parts of the British press. As the editor of The Sun, you'd probably know more about that than almost anyone in the country. I mean, does that, does that stack up? 100% not. Um, uh, we have lots of dealings with the press officers at the time for Harry and Meghan and in particular I've remembered some of my dealings with them going back to when they were still in the family. Um, never once was I given a negative story about other members of the royal family um, to, to, to you know, look after William and Kate for example um, and in fact a lot of the time um, we were given more positive stories about Harry and Meghan from the royal household officially so I can think, give you a really good example. We found out when it was going to be um, Meghan's hen do, and um, we kindly agreed that we wouldn't say where it was so it wouldn't ruin the event for us, so she could still go and have a nice time, but whilst we still got the story. That was personally agreed with Prince Harry. So the idea that we were always favouring William and Kate and the other royals over them is just simply not true. Susanna, what do you make of what's going on? I mean, it's been a sort of global news sensation. I think it's just ever so sad, and I think... Uh, at the heart of it is this terrible rift between brothers, 
between a son and his father. Um, I watched the documentary. I just feel like your stance on it depends on what you think their motivation is. Mm -hmm. There are people who think that their motivation is to discredit and dismantle the royal family and therefore they get a lot of reaction from people who think that that's appalling. There are some people who think that their motivation is to use their royal titles to get an enormous amount of money and of course they got a hundred million dollars apparently for this Netflix series so there are people who think that's terribly distasteful. I think their motivation is that they felt like they just had too much scrutiny publicity, intrusion, invasion of privacy. I know no people cough and splutter and say, well, they're, you know, they're hardly being the private now. Yeah. I feel like their motivation is they felt like they were hard done by, they felt like she suffered. We know she had these terrible mm -hmm. thoughts um, and an enormous sympathy for that. You also know that Harry saw his mother die in the, in the wake of terrible press intrusion and paparazzi. So I understand that they feel like they were intruded upon and their side of the story was never told. And briefly, Archbishop, I mean, you, you married them. You know all the characters involved. Um, can you see a way where they might be able to reconcile? I can't really come on, comment on it because I married them and there's sort of pastoral, pastoral confidentiality. There's always a way forward, but it has to be at the right time. And... Um, I, I, as a Christian, I live in the belief that forgiveness comes from God through Jesus Christ and that God, particularly at this time of year, God breaks into the world to open the way to forgiveness through the Christ child. But it has to, the way we welcome that opportunity is different for everyone and uh, there has to be a right time. OK, well, maybe it's now, maybe it's next year, maybe it's never. I'm not sure. We'll maybe have another word about that at the end of the programme. Thank you all very much for now. Now, there was sadly some terrible news this week about what happened in the Channel. Four people died after a migrant boat got into difficulties crossing on a freezing night. Those who re were rescued said they'd each paid £5,000 to cross. And it happened to take place the day after the Prime Minister announced new measures to stop the boats after weeks of building pressure from the Conservative backbenches. Rishi Sunak has promised a new unit to deal with claims from Albania, more staff to monitor small boats and also to speed up processing of asylum claims. And controversially, new laws that would say if you enter the UK illegally, you should not be able to stay in the country. The aims to stop the small boats and clear some of the backlog of asylum cases by the end of next year. I think we can now speak to the Shadow Home Secretary, Yvette Cooper, who's with us from Norwich. Good morning. Good morning, Laura. Last time you were on the programme, Yvette, we asked you whether a Labour government would want to see higher or lower immigration overall. Now, you didn't want to put a number on that then, but would you tell us today higher or lower immigration? Well, the net migration figure overall is at unusually high levels at the moment because of uh, Ukraine, because of um, the uh, support for people from Hong Kong, rightly, and also Afghanistan. Now, we would expect those numbers to come down in future years, and it is right that they should do so. We've also set out, you've heard Keir Starmer set out, proposals around Labour's approach to a points-based system. We think we should have a points-based system, but it should be better linked to action on training and tackling shortages in the economy as well. So Labour would expect numbers to come down if you we were would. in government. When it comes to small boats, now some of the things that the government announced were things that you'd actually been suggesting for a while, more staff speeding up claims. Yet Keir Starmer called the government's plans on this unethical. What was unethical about it? So the problem with the government's approach is that they're still not addressing that we're the heart of what's happened over the last few years. These boats are dangerous. We've seen lives being lost in the icy waters of the Channel and criminal gangs are profiting, making huge amounts of money from what has effectively become a multi-million pound criminal industry along our border, along the Channel. And at the same time, 
we've had really under 12 years of the Conservatives, a collapse in decision making by the Home Office, in the asylum system. It's broken because they've broken it and not taken those decisions. But would so you, you have change... to address those things. You have to address those things. And that means we have to go after the criminal gangs. The government hasn't yet, I think, announced the, the action that we need to go after those criminal gangs, to pursue them, to get prosecutions, to really target what has become this criminal industry and that is putting lives at risk. And what we've said is we would cancel the unworkable, unethical and unaffordable, incredibly expensive Rwanda plan that even the Home Secretary admits is failing and we would use that money for a major expansion, a new elite unit in the National Crime Agency to go after those gangs, to get some prosecutions and frankly get people in jail for the crimes that they have committed. Would you guarantee as a Home Secretary in a Labour government that you would cut the numbers of people coming in small boats? I think everybody should be trying to cut the number of dangerous boat crossings. They are putting lives at risk. So that should be a joint objective for both Britain and France, other countries working together as well. You need a, a stronger agreement with France in order to do that. We've also called for a replacement for the, the Dublin agreement to have an agreement around returns and family but reunion But Yvette Cooper, are you France guaranteeing well? to our audience this morning that if you were Labour's Home Secretary, you would cut the number of small boat arrivals and we would judge you on that? I'm being very clear that this would be our objective with France and should be the objective of the British government and frankly should be the objective of everyone to cut those numbers of boats to prevent lives being lost. Everyone should be pulling out all of the stops to try and prevent those dangerous boat but crossings. But in order to do that, you have to say you would have the major expansion of the National Crime Agency to go after the gangs. And At you've the moment, made that there's point. There's no consequences. So one of there's the no consequences. There's a tiny and number And you've made of that point. But one of the reasons this problem has become so acute is that there are a lack of legal routes into the country. Now, you say that you want to reform the safe routes into this country. Right now, you can only come from a refugee camp or Afghanistan or Hong Kong or Ukraine. Would a Labour government add countries to that list? For example, we see the brave female protesters in Iran. Would Labour offer a route for people to come here from Iran? Well, one of the things that we said you should do is if you should get, it could get a replacement. For the old Dublin Agreement, it included a family reunion route for those who, for example, refugees who had family in the United Kingdom, but it also included safe returns for those who had claimed asylum or had been through other countries, uh, in France and other countries as well. The government said that they would try and get a replacement for the Dublin Agreement, but then they didn't actually try to do but that. But I'm asking you a we specific that question important. about whether Labour would add countries to the list from where people would be able to come to the UK. There's a specific question there. Would you put Iran on the list? We see on our TV screens what's happening there. Would you make it possible for people to come from there directly to the UK? One of the things that the government set out, I think a few years ago, Sajid Javid set out, was a wider resettlement scheme that would allow people to come from other countries as well and would be a managed way to do that. The government in theory has that in place but it's not actually working properly. So one of the things that you could do is to make that system work effectively. However, if you simply look at the resettlement issues without tackling the criminal gangs, you don't address this problem because what happens is the criminal gangs just increase their marketing, their advertising on TikTok. That's the kind of thing. That and you've been made doing. that point. But so let's take another you specific have to do example. The two things hand in hand. But let's take another specific example of it, Cooper. You also have to target the but gangs. Let's take another specific example, though. We've asked you about Iran. I'm not sure we quite got an answer, but let's ask a different different question. Would a 16-year-old orphan from an East African country escaping persecution who's not in a refugee camp have a legal way to get to the UK if Labour were in government? We have said that there should be a way for child refugees who are on their own to be able to rejoin family in the but United Kingdom. But if they Kingdom. don't have family in the UK, would they be able to come here safely? 
If they don't have family, then we obviously did have the Dubs Agreement, which we long supported the Dubs Arrangement that was allowed the UK to do its bit alongside other countries. But bear in mind, what should be important there is the best interests of the child. So that child maybe should be looked after in other countries, and, and that decision has to be taken in the best interests of the child. But what there isn't at the moment is any way for a child refugee who may have uh, a brother or an aunt in the UK, maybe their only relative that can look after them, there used to be a, a way for those families to be reunited and the government ripped that up when they ripped up the Dublin Agreement and that's why we think you should have that new arrangement in place alongside safe returns and that's the kind of thing that would help address some of these issues but you know I know I keep going back to it you keep saying I've repeated it but it's really important that unless you go after the criminal gangs mm -hmm. alongside any of these measures then the strategy won't really uh, address the small boats. But there are other changes to the law too. Now the government has introduced this notion of the Nationality and Borders Act where you create an offence of illegal entry. Now that matters because it makes a criminal of anyone who comes to this country who hasn't taken a legal route if they haven't got permission. Would you scrap that offence if you win the election? Well it's not working is it? So that wasn't the my question. Would you but, scrap, would you scrap but it's it? It's important to look at what, what, what the government has done. So they promised a whole series of things in their Nationalities and Borders Bill. They promised that they would make it a, a criminal offence. They promised that it would stop the boat's crossings. They promised that it would um, break the business model. They promised that it would cut the number of boats and that everybody would be returned. In fact, the opposite has happened. But Yvette Cooper, We've I'm asking a you a very increase. specific question. I know, but if you were Home Secretary, the government has introduced this concept, this offence of coming to this country and taking an illegal entry, would a Labour government scrap that offence? It's really important for all the reasons that you've been saying, but it's a very specific question. Would you scrap that offence? It is, but it's important to see why it is not working, Laura. So the reason well, if it's not what's working, happened, why wouldn't you well, scrap let me finish, it? Or then let me finish the point. It's important because it is not working. What you've seen instead is an increase in the number of boats, You've seen uh, a drop in the number of decisions being taken, longer delays in the system, and all that they've done is ramp up the rhetoric. So what it shouldn't be is a criminal offence for someone to arrive in from Ukraine who has been fleeing persecution and conflict. Well, Ukrainians can come here asylum. legally, but if they don't have, as, you, as you well know. But if they don't have the right papers, then they are effectively committing a crime. But if, as that you doesn't say, make any sense and it doesn't help. So we don't think that is what the arrangement should be and that was what we voted against. We voted against the Nationalities and Borders Bill because all it's done is increase the rhetoric and it's actually made the problem worse. But this it's is a added really to the delays, important and, and specific it's also, question. We've seen more boats arriving. And I'm, I'm going to have another go. If Labour wins the election and you're the Home Secretary, would you get rid of that criminal offence of illegal entry? But I, I answered your question, Laura, because the point is it is wrong to have a situation where if somebody arrives from Ukraine with the wrong papers, it should be a criminal offence. It's already against the immigration rules. There are ways in which you can have an immigration response and the asylum system already should be able to return people who are not fleeing persecution and conflict. That's not happening either at the moment. So it's why we called for a fast track for Albania, because you do have people, and for other safe countries, you do have people people arriving in the United Kingdom who are then from countries that are not fleeing persecution and conflict, no decisions being taken on their cases, only one, less than 1% 1 of cases from Albania in the last year have been decided and that means that people aren't being returned if they're not fleeing persecution and conflict but refugees who are aren't getting support. So we think there should be a fast track system. So make the asylum system work. Uh, make the uh, return those who are not fleeing persecution and conflict, support those who are, because the UK has always done its bit to help those fleeing persecution and conflict, but don't make people who are fleeing pers persecution and conflict, for example from Ukraine, into criminals, because that is unworkable okay. as well as being wrong. Yvette Cooper, we must leave it there. It's a huge agenda and it's great to have you on the programme as you. ever. Thank you very much for your time this morning. Now. You didn't think we were going to get to the end of 2022 without hearing more about space, did you? Because nearly 26 days after it launched into space, the Orion capsule splashed down into the Pacific Ocean after a fiery re-entry into Earth's atmosphere. You might remember, before it set off, we spoke to its designer, Howard Hugh, 
and now it's back, so is he. I asked him, where's Orion right now? Well, right now it's still in San Diego. Uh, we're gonna be uh, taking it off uh, the USS Portland uh, in the next few days and uh, then put it on our transportation fixture and then driving across the country uh, back to the Kennedy Space Center. What was it like for you seeing the capsule in action flying through space? It was just a tremendous sense of pride for what we've accomplished uh, along the way, uh, not only just the mission itself, but what it took to get to uh, launch and get to uh, deep space. And then also just uh, how um, I was maybe surreal. I, I don't know. That's kind of, you know, you're, you're, you're trying to not only, uh, you know, execute the mission, but as a fan, as a, as a, uh, a fan of human space flight, you know, watching it and being on inspired by the images and, and what it means uh, to me personally as, uh, as a first step to, uh, you know, a, a sustainable presence we're gonna have out not only in the moon, but beyond. We spoke before and you said it's a bit like being an anxious parent. Did it work out as you hoped or did anything surprise you? Um, I would say better than I hoped. Um, you know, it exceeded all our expectations in terms of just how well it performed across all the subsystem areas. You know, we had some minor issues that we had to deal with, but nothing that uh, uh, certainly uh, raised, uh, I would say, a huge concern for us. Every day, I, I, I couldn't, uh, I would say, I couldn't uh, wait to go into the work just to see what's happening, you know, what was going on. So yeah, definitely wanted to watch our, our, uh, our baby uh, take its first steps and, and uh, really uh, be independent. If humans had been on board the flight, would they have survived? Oh yeah, I mean, I, except for, you know, we didn't have air and water, you know, food. Uh, you need those kinds of things, I, I would say, but uh, certainly from a, a flying perspective and, uh, you know, we'll obviously see the data come back, but all expectation is, is certainly the spacecraft is human rated and ready to fly people. And what did you learn from those amazing images? I know others will be uh, reviewing the images. You know, the, I, I think for me, as, as, a, as more of a fan of, of space, I would say that uh, the beauty of our Earth, the beauty of the moon, it was just amazing. And uh, hopefully we'll find some other uh, surprising images uh, that we didn't get on the streaming uh, or we haven't downloaded yet. And uh, we'll have some more beautiful shots. And did the landing go according to plan? Oh, it was, I mean, it went as, as planned uh, exceedingly well, I would say. You know, we, our target landing site, uh, our requirement, what we want to do is uh, 5.4 nautical miles. We hit it uh, within 2.1 nautical miles. So overall performance was amazingly well. Our, our guidance system, our navigation system operated. And of course you saw our, our big, big three shoots came out. They came out as, time, as planned, uh, beautifully executed, brought it down to about uh, 16 miles per hour. So we came from 20, 24,581 miles at entry interface down to landing uh, about 16 miles per hour. There was this incredible bounce. I mean, in simple terms, can you explain how it works? The, the very simple term, it's very much like skipping a rock across a pond, okay? And what we, we're trying to do is really increase the range so that we can hit, actually, I wouldn't use the word hit, land safely at a precise point every time we come back from the moon. And that's the whole idea of skip entry. What about getting people to Mars? Has this mission made that more realistic? So the moon is a great opportunity for us to learn and uh, live and operate and, uh, and then take the, I would say, an, another uh, a really big step to go to Mars. And uh, I hope I can see that in my uh, lifetime. Certainly excited uh, f to be able to provide that first step and uh, be part of that first step uh, going forward. There is, though, a scarcity of resources on Earth and people are worried about climate change. Do you worry about devoting resources instead to space missions? I don't know how to uh, uh, answer that question in terms of, you know, the resources and things like that. I think we have challenges across, you know, a lot of, a lot of areas, uh, but certainly space inspires. Space drives, I think, the best of us and uh, ex exploration and being able to, you know, advance the technologies that will, I think, benefit everybody on Earth uh, as we try to meet the challenges in the deep space are gonna be one of the things that I think when we reflect back on history will show that uh, we were able to make those kinds of uh, benefits for everybody.
There is a lot of competition getting into space, though. Is NASA going to beat the billionaires? Uh, so I don't see it as a race. I see it more of a cooperative uh, uh, effort to try to advance as much as we can as, as, a, as, uh, as, as people on this planet to try to get to another planet. Howard Hugh, such a pleasure. Thank you so much. Howard Hugh, there's a man with exciting predictions for 2023. Let's ask our panel as we come to the end of our show this morning, their predictions for 2023. Um, Victoria Newton, the editor of The Sun, what's in your expectation? Well, I really hope and pray that uh, we have peace in Ukraine, but I don't think there'll be peace in the House of Windsor, I'm afraid. Susanna, where's your crystal ball pointing? Um, I have a feeling that Matt Hancock will start making pitches for things like your job, <laughs> Laura, and that we might see Boris Johnson do I'm a celebrity, get me out of here, well, considering what a profile, extra profile that gave That would be quite a spectacle, that. goodness me. Um, Archbishop, what would your prediction for next year be? Well, um, for this evening, um, I'm afraid that I, it's the only thing that the Pope and I differ on that I know of, which is I'm hoping France win. He's obviously hoping Argentina win. <laughs> We're going together to South Sudan in February, and I hope there's an outbreak of peace in that forgotten war. And here, the, I, my prayer is for food bank use to diminish, and people to realise the churches are here before, during and after crises, and find the hope and love of Christ there. Okay, all three of you, thank you. It's been such a pleasure having you in the studio this morning and giving us your thoughts. I've tried to avoid saying it this morning, but it really has been an extraordinary year, but maybe I couldn't help using that word after all. And with looming recession, strikes, and the ongoing war abroad next year, might hold fewer surprises, but it certainly won't be a walk in the park. A tough backdrop against which Rishi Sunak has to try to drag the Tory party back from disaster. And for Labour's Keir Starmer to try to turn a chunky poll lead into a permanent and convincing advantage. We will be back from January the 8th every Sunday to try to understand what's going on and bring you some of the world's positive excitements too. It is also, and there isn't a better word, an extraordinary pleasure to have got our show on the road and to have enjoyed so many important conversations with you in our studio. So from me and the wonderful team I'm lucky to work with, thank you so much for watching, emailing, posting, or heading to iPlayer, where, as ever, you can catch up on anything that we've done since September. As you know, one of our habits here is from time to time to bring you something really gorgeous. And the Royal Albert Hall has been celebrating its 150th year. So ahead of its annual carol concert, the National Youth Choir of Great Britain has done a special arrangement of the Carol of the Bells for us, a beautiful piece of music based on a Ukrainian folk chant and arranged by Ben Parry. What better way to wish you from all of us here a very, very Merry Christmas. Goodbye. Thank you.